Yo, welcome back to another episode of Boy Things Podcast. You don't know I'm carrying Boy Things, and today we want to break the chains on mask and addiction. Now, in this episode, we delve deep into the harrowing world of drug abuse and addiction, shedding light on the lives affected by the crisis. Now, we'll be exploring the stories of resilience, hope, and recovery, while also addressing the critical issues surrounding addiction and abuse in our society. Through compelling narratives and expert insights, we aim to raise awareness, inspire change, and offer a glimmer of hope to those in the throes of addiction. We're now joined by John Doe, who is a current drug abuser. All right, John Doe, good, good day to you. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're going to just jump right in. Can you tell us about your experiences with drugs? At what age was your first experience with hardcore drugs? Um, what I'd consider to be hardcore drugs are anything that have like vitamins, you know, mm -hmm. anything that falls under the line of narcotics. So you would call marijuana hardcore drugs? No. No? No. So not. your first hardcore drug was what exactly? Um, I'd probably have to say Adderall if I'm going to be, yeah, Adderall? politically correct. Yeah, Adderall. And at what age was that? Um, 13. It was 13. prescribed. So it's prescribed to you for yeah. a medical condition? Yeah, for ADD. Okay, and then that transitioned into what next? Um, well, I started selling Adderall and started selling Xanax and stuff okay. like that. Yeah. Um, and I think the second one I tried was Molly, uh, definitely. At what age? When I was 16. And this was introduced to you by friends? You yeah, just, by one of my friends. So you've, at 16, mm -hmm. you're still in high school, I'm assuming, like fifth form? Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, fifth, well, I was... Yeah, fifth form going mm -hmm. in sixth form. Um, can you just explain to us, um, at 16, taking Molly for the first time, what did that feel like, like, in terms of your body and your emotions? Did well, you have a trip? Uh, not going to lie, it was actually, like, one of the craziest, like, emotional experiences. Yeah. Because I was there, like, my sister and her friends and stuff, and, like, I don't know what it was, but I immediately just started getting happy. And I you know, hugged my sister and was like, mm. oh, you know, I love you. So you're more emotional? So, yeah. You're but more, I was more like, I don't yeah. know, ecstatic, like euphoric. You know? Yeah. Uh, so how long did this feeling last for of the Mali? Um, it lasted pretty long because I was at a, um, one of my family's vacation houses mm. and I left. I got my sister left, went fast swim, went to the gym. Came back and it was still. That's what like a whole day. Yeah, it was yeah. like six hours probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then after Molly, what was next? Um, mm, Xanax, mm -hmm. lean, mm -hmm. um, narcotics, narcotics. Ever tried cocaine before? Definitely, definitely. At what age was your first experience with cocaine? First experience, 21. 21. 21. Mm -hmm. And you were in a social setting, someone gave it to you, you just decided to try it. Yeah, what intrigued your office. interest? You were at your office yeah. and somebody was there using? Yeah, well, I was kind of tired. Yeah. Know? And, you know, one of my friends was just like, all right, you know, if you need to stay up, because I've been partying all night the night mm -hmm. before, and it was like, no, man, this will keep you up. You know, if you need to get through the day, this will yeah. save your life. And I was just like, you know, it makes sense. But cocaine in Jamaica seems very taboo. Like, you know, we we don't really hear much of cocaine users, really and truly. No. Um, so, what really went through your mind? Because, obviously, your friend just said, hey, try this, hey, just try it. Like, you never have no concerns, you never ask no questions. Like, wait, how did you get this? Was this your first time seeing cocaine? Well, no. So, that's the thing. And I also used to sell similar types of drugs before. Like, for oh. example, Adderall. Yes. That's prescribed for ADD, which yes. I was actually prescribed for. It's actually very similar in its chemical composition to cocaine. It's mm -hmm. kind of weird. But the problem, I guess the taboo, I think, in lies with the how you take the drug, right? Because you do have people that snort Adderall. Right? Okay, yeah. yeah. But then if, for instance, if I'm in this room right now and somebody mm -hmm. says, you know, you're tired, try some cocaine. But, so you were around it for a while? Yes, I already knew, like, you know, the for side effects people. and, yeah. you know, stuff. So I had, I had basic added? knowledge, yeah. Okay. Um, and how you felt after, I'm assuming that you snorted it? Yeah, correct. Yeah? How you felt that day? Were you energized? Uh, I had a burst of energy for probably like three, four hours. And then after that, I was just like, yeah, I'm clocking out to work for the day. 
So it, it, it gave me the extra boost for a couple of hours, but yeah. I don't know about the other thing. Was it something that you continue to 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 do? So to indulge in? Yes and no. So I, I tried it that time for the first time. And I didn't try it again for like I don't know five years. Mm -hmm. Five years, yeah. 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 So then after trying it for the five years, um after that five years pause and then you tried it again. Yeah, I tried using it in a recreational space after that. Yeah, Can you explain to our listeners and watchers and viewers what do you mean? So recreational space we in a you know party um relaxing environment leisure space right versus a workspace or a productive space mm. like work yeah <laughs> or at my office, you know? so so would you say that a lot of people like in your estimation right mm. for cocaine usage and like for hard drug usage in jamaica based on your socioeconomic background and people where you're around is it something that is being used often or by many people um, definitely definitely um and i would say i wouldn't say it's like a strict thing but like it's very commonplace uh, i remember seeing a meme on instagram one time that said growing up is learning that everybody else does cocaine except you <laughs> so would you say that you're an addict like how often do you like do drugs drugs high drugs the molly and the ecstasy and the cocaine and, and what else do you do um so molly i always say molly when i'm like doing like weekend festivals or week mm -hmm. long weekend parties yes just to keep the vibe up and you know to get through the weekend um cocaine is kind of like a different relationship um that if i'm just chilling if i'm just like you know doing work or whatever i don't need it you know so i'll probably only do it when i'm going to a party but if i have to crunch like if i have like a random proposal i need to draft up or i have a meeting that i'm kind of anxious about then yeah Definitely, it's laughing a couple lines. But the thing is, it is it has a different effect when you take it in um, w along with alcohol. So when you drink and you coke at the same time, it has a completely different effect than What's that effect? I would say the Adderall effect. What's that effect in comparison to Adderall? Um, it's more high energy, less focus. Mm -hmm. um, how would I put this? It actually, your thoughts aren't necessarily linear. So it's actually crazy because if you are creative and you're in a creative space, it'll cause you to, to like think a lot. But your thoughts are more circular and not linear, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. So would you, would you then say that it is not a taboo drug in Jamaica based on what you're now saying that you, you have friends who... No, it's just basically it's taboo in pop culture and in the media because yeah, okay. they don't talk about it but just because you don't talk about it doesn't mean it's not prevalent can we talk about access to the drug is it hard to find cocaine like do you just walk, like walk to somebody and be like hey do you sell coke or or you just know people that know no, people? You can ask people honestly you know because it's not a popular thing as i said it's prevalent but it's not popular mm -hmm. you could ask anybody you wanted to get blue and they're just going to look at you and be like all right cool they're going to Look it up and down and judge it and be like, yeah. is this guy going to try and get the laptop, up, right? And when you say blow, you're referring to cocaine? Of course, yes. Yeah, okay, all right. So I'm going to try and make everybody, you know, can keep up with the jargons and the terminologies. Um, yeah, man, but as long as they feel like they're not getting set up, they'll be like, yeah, man, yeah. I'm already down the road. <laughs> Boom, man, that's it. Is it expensive? Uh, relatively, yes. But for, relatively for drugs and oil markets, but in terms of prices in Jamaica, yeah. it is very cheap here compared to prices of where I right. um, take Walk me through then the pricing. Like, say for instance, you're having a night of fun with your friends. Um, what right, would no. that look like? A night of fun with the friends in Jamaica? Yes, yes, yes. Your drug yes. bill coming up to about $10,000. $10,000. A night of fun in Florida, your drug bill coming up to like $1,100. Yes, so, yeah. for the persons who we've kind of grown into this culture of you know people saying that cocaine has ruined families and you know hard drugs and when we see those persons on the street and you know jamaicans have said oh this person's a cokehead um is that the same cocaine that you're taking well for the most part a lot of them um it is a derivative crack cocaine which is completely different um, okay there's some crazy stuff what is the difference but don't try crack guys what is the difference between crack cocaine and cocaine um, so I actually don't know the 
chemical yeah. difference. Yeah. But yeah. I know that whatever it is, the mm -hmm. level of euphoria and the, um, what do you call it? I don't know, there's a specific word for how the energy is um, like metabolized in mm -hmm. your body. It's very crazy. But it's like a thousand times higher than with regular cocaine. It's actually like, I don't know what it is, but from what I've heard, there is no way to like escape your need for pleasure when mm -hmm. you're on that thing. And it's very crazy. So then people, and I've heard this before, and you came on my radio show, and I think you said that crack is the cheaper version to, to cocaine. Yeah, well, okay, the thing is, cocaine has many different facets to it, and one of them is euphoria and pleasure, right? And I feel like crack emphasizes that aspect without all the other things. Yeah, so all it's right. like a super pleasure drug, but that pleasure only exists in your mind. Can you tell us about other forms of, um, other types of drugs that you've done, other than, so we now know about the Adderall, we now know about cocaine, we now know about, she said, Molly. Yeah. What else have you tried? Um, well, I mean, ecstasy, shrooms, LSD. Shrooms is mushrooms. Mushrooms, yes. yeah. LSD. Psilocybin mushrooms. LSD is what? Um, yeah, I actually don't remember. Is it a pill? Is it a uh, liquid? No, it's a, it's a liquid that they usually soak into paper, paper tabs, mm -hmm. and then they cut it. So, Does that or you can same, take it in liquid form. Do you get the same effect from LSD, from our cocaine? No, man, LSD is a hallucinogen. So, um, LSD and mushrooms would fall in a similar category. Mm -hmm. um, LSD is a stronger hallucinogen than, and I've tried 2CB as well. 2CB is a very hard hallucinogen, right? That is very crazy. So you go through a mind trip? Yes. Yeah. And how long does this last for? So uh, mushrooms would last about, I'd say on average, 6 to 8 hours. LSD on average would last 12 to 14 hours. And 2CB, yeah. I do not know how long that lasts, but when I took that, I lost almost one weekend. Like, I, the memories of that weekend are very botched, but it was very crazy. And the thing is, the viewers can't see you, but I'm looking at you, and you, like, when you're talking about these drugs, like, you're you're smiling, like, like it gives you some form of, like, the memories that comes with it. Yes, the memories. I've, yeah. I've never taken any form of hard drugs in a negative environment or around, like, you know, people I can't trust. Have you ever gotten a negative trip or a negative experience from doing drugs? Um, yes, several times. Several times. Yes. Do you want to share the worst one with us? Um, mm, mm. Minus random things like hangovers and stuff, because, you know, different strokes for different folks. Everybody shouldn't mix everything. Like, I do not recommend being cocaine and eat together if you can't manage it. You mm. know what I mean? But, um... Mm. I'd have to say I had a really bad shrooms trip once, mm. and uh, I understood why people said don't fall asleep on shrooms. So I'd taken a, I was doing shrooms with my sister and my friends and stuff, and we were very weird, right? Whenever we try new drugs for the first time, we'd like to go to a police station yes. and just tell all the police they're here, and we're going to sit down in the parking lot and do drugs. So in case... In Jamaica? <laughs> in Jamaica. So in so case the anything... Said. They'd laugh at us because they never thought we were serious, but we were being dead serious. And we're just like, in case, I guess we just thought we were going to like, up to do because they're at the bus. Yeah. You know, so, but we'd be serious and we do that just in case anything bad happens. Yeah. Somebody's there to, you know, help us. Because if we stay at the hospital, it's an immediate bill if they come to help you. If you stay at the police station and the police take you to the hospital, then they take you to the ER. And it's free. Right. And it's free. We're going to take a break and I'm going to ask you about, you know, your family and your family dynamics and relationships after this oh, break, yes. because you've spoken about your sister quite a lot of times. So I'm going to ask you some questions about that. But as a fact here before going break, you know, the, you know, alcohol continues to be the, the substance most widely used by Jamaican adolescents, um, followed by tobacco, marijuana and inhalants. Now we take a break um, and then you'll hear more from John Doe when we come back. Hi, my name is Joseph Johnson, executive chef and owner of Peckish. Peckish is known for our daily delicious lunch service. But what you might not know is that we do catering. Our catering services for every special occasion that you might have. Your birthday, your baby shower, definitely your wedding, your special day. Call us. <laughs> All 
All right, so welcome back. Um, we're still here with John Doe. Now, another fact, you know, 35 million people worldwide uh, suffer from drug use disorder, while only one in seven people receive treatment, according to a report from the United Nations. Now, we were talking about your family, and we're talking about accessibility. Um, here in Kingston, just uh, if... Do you have one set dealer? Do you have multiple dealers? You know, do you have multiple people that you can get these hard drugs from? The cocaine and the LSDs and the shrooms? Yeah. Well, um, I'm a little bit of a different character. Mm -hmm. So I've been selling drugs since I was 13, from before I was doing drugs. So okay. I have a vast network of people I know who do also sell drugs. And yeah. Stuff. But in general, Jamaica is a very small society. Um, Kingston City. I mean, we have less than a million people here, and if you want to do it by, um, you want to do a comparison, sorry, Gaza City has 2.3 million people, and it's smaller than here. So, I mean, we're, we're very small. So accessibility right? It's not that hard basically. to know people, yeah, it's not okay. a problem. Um, before we're into the break, you kind of mentioned your, you know, sister multiple mm -hmm. times. Your family members know that you are on these hard drugs? Uh, most of them, but the thing is, I'm not really on drugs constantly. Well, so using or have you used? Using, or, yes. 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 Your parents? Um, for the most part, yes. For the most part, yes. Your friends? Definitely. Do you think that using or abusing drugs um, ruins your relationship, like intimate relationships or friendships in any way, shape, or form? Well, for you particularly. I think if you have negative personality traits and they're exasperated by the use of drugs, yeah. I think they will ultimately ruin your relationships. But chances are you'd ruin them on your own anyways. <laughs> <laughs> would you say that you're an addict? Because what would you define as an addict in your estimation, in your own words? Um, an addict to you, and would you classify yourself as an addict? Uh, no, I, I would say that I was an addict at one point. At what point? Um... A couple of years ago, I did use drugs as a crutch, and I was going through a really bad breakup. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, one of those extended breakups, so it's on and off breakups, so yeah. you know, it's, it's not really official. Yeah, that was a little bit like emotionally traumatizing. So you use that to kind of get as a crutch, off. yeah, to get over it. So you would have considered yourself as an addict. Um, not right now. Not right now, because you can go long periods without using. Um, it's not even that. It's just that I don't feel to. You know, and it's not usually um, by then, I, like any time I get like a feeling of boredom or sadness or mm. depression and, you know, my yeah. thoughts start attacking me or my anxiety, then I'd immediately feel the need to get relief. And that was an issue. So I'd always be drinking all the time. And once I start drinking, chances are, you know, I'm going to end up using something else. Yeah. So that was just a consistent thing for like probably like a year, um, a year and a half. Yeah. Um, but as I said, the breakup also was consistent throughout that period. It also yeah. took a year, year and a half. So um, I'd say that was more like a specific situation. When is the last time you've done any form of hard drugs? Um, yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah. And what was that? Um, um, cocaine. Yesterday, like last night? Yesterday, like kind of day? Um, yeah, day through to the night. Day through to the night. Mm -hmm. And how are you feeling now? Perfectly fine. Well rested. Well rested. But I wasn't drinking alcohol. Oh, so you were doing it? No, yeah. I was crunching to um, finish up another proposal for something. And you feel so. completely fine now, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. Just don't bother us play fire. It's um, very well, <laughs> well relaxed. You know? For the persons who are watching, though, who are like, you know, you you are, you know, speaking like these hard drugs are, are, are heaven, basically, right? And, you know, it seems like you're saying that you're completely functional mm -hmm. on these drugs. Like you can go to your meetings, you, you are doing proposals oh. on them. Um, for the people who are just watching, you know, like, oh, I don't believe that it's all, you know, sunshines on these mm -hmm. hard drugs. What do you say? Um, I would say that they have very specific use cases for me. And I believe their use cases would be different for everybody. And the same use cases they have for me, most definitely would not apply to everybody else. Right, especially if you don't understand and not aware like your body. I know a lot of people who will drink and they don't even understand when they're getting drunk and that's a very scary thing to me. Mm. Because the second I feel a little warmth in my blood, I know when that little touching me. Yeah. You know, so if you're not um, self aware and you're not Yeah, if you're not knowledgeable, just leave things alone. Anything you don't know about, just leave it alone. Do you have any plans on stop doing drugs all Taylor? Um, yeah man, when I die. When you die? Yeah, man. 
I, I, I'm pretty sure my usage will drop dramatically when I have kids because I'll have less need to. Yes. You know, I can get the same euphoria I can get from doing a bump for it, you know, but in a split front to see my daughter smile. You're I'm not bumping sure. exactly. Um, I keep bump, like. I keep bump of cocaine. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing, like, it's a means to end. Yeah. Um, and as I said, that's why I use the word use cases for certain things. You yeah. Know what I mean? So you're not an addict. You can do without it. Um, you only do it socially or when you are outside or just kind of feel like, you know, this is a need for it. Essentially, yes. Yeah, so you're not an addict in at all and you can... By, by, by my definition, no. no. Right. But, but as I say, I don't really feel to do it. It's more like I'm doing something and I'll be like, all right, cool. Yeah. I'll just be out there and be like, oh, fine. It's not like uh, I need this. Like, oh my God, I got to get up tomorrow morning and I have to do... Yeah. some lines of cocaine or yeah, yeah. or you know I don't, I don't feel like i urge for it okay um just in the event that you you might find yourself in the future using more and more and more and more do you have a support system in place to to assist you or like friends we can maybe just call and be like yo bro you know say i kind of feel like i'm using too much right now um or, oh, or, yeah. or your family like your sister yeah, my friends yeah. and my family are very supportive. Yeah. At the end of the day, uh, I don't think it would even, they would come to me if they notice any difference, right, any, change, right. any negative changes in yeah. anything, right? So and that's always been the case from day one. Okay. So, well, for that. well, thank you for sharing your story. Yes, I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate um, you walking through this journey of, of, of drugs. Now, before you go, what is the strongest drug that you've used? You said it was the... 2CB. 2CB. Yes. Okay. That was crazy. And you said that marijuana is not a hard drug to you? No. It's just a not. recreational type of thing? Um, yeah, I, I don't think it should be. It is a recreational drug. That's why it's used commonly, but yeah. But I don't think it's a hard drug. All right. Well, that's the story from John Doe. Now, you know, stick and stay. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back from the break, a former drug user um, stole from family members to to maintain his addiction. So we're going to hear his story and how he got over that and how he's at the place where he's at right now. Hey guys, it's Chavez Bridge and I'm here with some great news. The Ambassador Program is finally here. Go on the website, click Become an Ambassador and check out the requirements. Do you have what it takes to become an ambassador? Always wanted to work with the bridge, work with great products, share our platform, show us your talents. Check out how to become an ambassador on our website. I look forward to seeing you. Let's work. Welcome back to the show. Now we continue to focus on drug use and addiction. And we have a former drug addict um, who has transformed his life and now helps others to be free of the illness. Now, Mr. Richard Maynard, who is the executive assistant at uh, Jamaica at uh, Teen Challenge Jamaica. Yes. Now, welcome. Adult and Teen adult Challenge. And teen challenge. Yes, well, we have recently changed the yes. name to Adult and Teen Challenge. Well, welcome to the show, sir. Thank I, you. I thank you so much for you know being a part of this discussion. Um, before you came on set, there was uh, someone by the name of John Doe, who is a current user. Um, he's done drugs from, he was, he said 13. He's now in his late 20s. Um, he has done all form of drugs, uh, from LSD to 2CB to Adderall to cocaine. Um, I asked him if he identifies or would you know, classify himself as an addict, and he said, no, he's not an addict. Um, because he can do it out. It's not something that he yearns for daily. Um, what's your take on that? Uh, there are people that you could consider functional users, mm -hmm. social users. When you get to the point where it becomes commonplace, it becomes a like a meal to you. Yes. That's when you know you're definitely an addict. But you also have different stages. Mm -hmm. You'll have, like for me, I started with experiment with cigarette and beer mm -hmm. from as early as eight years old. With cigarettes? Yes. At eight? So your parents gave you the cigarette? Not gave it to me, but my father smoked, mm -hmm. drank, 
a lot of the other family members who didn't smoke drunk. Mm-hmm. So, you know, growing up in Jamaica, liquor is always in the house. Yeah. I would drink beer and father would give me a sip of a rum. As a matter of fact, I learned to mix my first drink before I was 10. Wow. Father would ask me to mix him a drink. So you started with cigarettes at age eight. Um, when did you really started to divulge or start to divulge into harder drugs? Okay. And what were those drugs? And as a teenager, you know, in the 70s, when weed was really coming out of the, the bushes, so yes, to speak, yes. you know, I started experimenting with weed. As a matter of fact, the first time, first spliff I smoke, I smoke one whole spliff and never said, so what's this? Your first one? spliff? Yeah. Roll up one and smoke it on Sunday. At what age was this? I was probably about 15. And you smoke off of one whole spliff by a yourself? A whole spliff. And back then, we never have Rizla for you, so it was brown bag, so it is bigger than the average spliff yeah. now, right? And I smoked the first one and it never do anything for me. Really? I roll another one. Yeah. When I got to the house, I remember walking through the front door and it was like everything just went black for yes. a second. And I went straight to the kitchen, share myself a hefty meal, mm. which would be like twice my normal meal. Yes. And had ate it all off. Mm-hmm. My mother came in and saw me and said, Well, you feel good today, man. Because, you know, parents love to see youngsters eat. Eat, so yes. Eat it off, man. While I'm halfway through it, my best friend came in, offered him some. I shared him a regular plate, and I still finished mine before his, and got up and went straight to bed. Yeah. That is when my mother realized that something was wrong. Because I must be sick yes. for me to leave my friend in the kitchen eating yes. and go to bed. So did she ask you at that yes, point? Yes, she came in and she asked and I couldn't, I remember, I couldn't open my eyes. I could hear her, I could speak to her, but I just could not open my eyes. And she kept prodding and prodding till I told her that I had smoked some weed. And it was, to me, she was about to go mad. Wow. And she asked my friend, what should she do? Because he was, she was a ganja smoker. Mm-hmm. But he never gave it to me. He was older than me and he always looked at me as a little brother. Yes. And he would not allow me to smoke anything more than cigarettes around him. Yes. And I couldn't drink nothing more than a beer. Mm-hmm. So at that moment, though, um, after going through all of that and experience and, you know, seeing your mother in that state, you continued? Well, I didn't trouble weed again for maybe more than a year. Okay. It was in my final year at high school that I really started to smoke some more, but I was more careful to smoke in small quantities yes. because I realized that it would not have hit me bang, mm-hmm. but it would creep up on me. So then you, you know, d- dipped and dabbled in, in weed for years then, yes. basically. Um, yes. Did that propel into something else? Yes. At, for... I would say four years after high school, I I was a, a, I would say a ganja addict because I would roll my spliffs like a cig- like cigarettes and have them in a little packet. Mm. So everywhere I'm going, I am walking around with five to ten joints. But people always say, especially on social media nowadays, people are saying that, oh, you can't be an addict to weed, and I'm just like. You can. Well, people are addicted even to electronics. Yes. And so anything that controls you that you cannot do without. Then you're an addict. You're an addict. Yeah. Did you move on to harder drugs? Yes. From marijuana? I, I moved on to cocaine. Well, I tried sniffing cocaine. When was the first time? Socially. Uh, the first time I tried, I was hanging out with some friends too. A couple yes. of them were smoking chalice. I was never... I tried chalice, but I wasn't, I had to be up moving all around and chalice smoking is something you have to do up on ends where you don't have nowhere to go. And yes, and yes. Yes, so I'm always on the move. So I was introduced to, to sniffing cocaine. I tried it, but I, from primary school, I was diagnosed with acute sinusitis. Yes. So 
the sniffing did not work well for me. At what age was this? Um, you trying cocaine for the I first time? I would have been, I would say, about twenty-two. And who introduced you to cocaine? It was a, f a friend because mm -hmm. we all used to hang out and party together. So I would say a friend at the time, and um, but he wasn't an addict. Yeah. Funny enough, he would take a line, and that's it. Yes. So after your first time trying, because you know, I think here in Jamaica. Cocaine is sort of taboo. In uh, for those who don't know, yes, you would yes. say that this is a taboo thing. Um, but after trying it for the first time, how did you feel? Uh, sniffing it pretty much numbed my face. I didn't see. To me, I thought I got more out of weed from yeah. sniffing mm -hmm. cocaine because it just numbed my, my, my face and my nose would run. Mm, so ain't never really like that. That was yeah. Me. And I was more of a smoker. Yes. My father was alcoholic, so I was determined not, not to, be. to be like him. Right. But the, Okay, so then after that first experience, you continued on the weed? Yes. So I became, I was a smoker as opposed to a drinker. Right. Hence my, my not drinking strong liquor, so to speak. Yeah. I'm a, I would be a beer drinker. A beer drinker. Um, did you partake in cocaine ever again after that first uh, yes, a couple of times, but nothing major. Yeah. Then one night I was hanging out with some friends, smoking weed, playing music. In comes this other friend. Richard, I have something here that you need to try. Mm. This can make you rich. This can make you get any woman you want. Mm. Now, for a 20 plus year old man, I would think those are the two most important Money things. and woman. Yes. Yeah. When I ask. Uh, the bells just go off. Yes, Ding. in your head. What I did not know was that it wasn't to use it. Because the only way you can make anything out of that is not by using it. Right. And I tried it, and it became a major part of my life. It gradually. And we're speaking about cocaine? Yes, crack yes. cocaine. Crack cocaine. Yes. Can you tell us how to identify the difference between okay. cocaine and crack cocaine? Crack cocaine is a form of cocaine in that it's a powdered cocaine that is processed with baking soda. And it's actually cooked, as we call it. Yes. Till it forms a solid. And then that solid is put on, used on a pipe. Or some people would crush that out and put it in cigarettes also. So, so you it use it... a cheaper form of cocaine I thought than ask the powder it as well. because you would have less cocaine in it than the powdered cocaine. So it's more caught with different yes, things. Yes. Um, when you say put in a pipe, what do you mean? You put it in a pipe and smoke it? Yes. So the little ball or rock, as they would call it, yes. you put that in the pipe and right. you smoke and it. And there are various different types of pipes. Like the first time I tried it, I was using a glass pipe yes. with water, just like a chalice. How did you feel? Because you tried cocaine, you know, a couple of times. They say never like it. Mm -hmm. Now you're, because, you know, obviously sinus problems and things like that. Now you're doing crack cocaine in a pipe. I'm assuming that one puff is supposed yes. to be high, like a kite. Yes. Uh, it's a different high from weed in that cocaine is a, considered an upper. Yes. And right. weed would and be a donor. would be a donor. Yes. And for the so, viewers and listeners, can we just explain? Okay. An upper keeps you awake. Yes. A donor makes you drowsy. Yes. So that, that's the difference. As a mm. matter of fact, in the, the, out there in the streets, a lot of cocaine smokers will tend to smoke weed after, especially when they are out of funds and out of ways to get more cocaine. So to bring down the high. To bring down the yes. high and to get to sleep. So the first time I, you did crack cocaine, you know, you're high, you're up, you're yes. alert. But I didn't have much, so, and it was the first time, and you just took what you were given, and yeah. but I found that the next day I wanted again, mm. and I went looking for the guy every evening. Your friend. Yes. Yes. And he would come with some every evening for the first cup, I would say first week or so. Then I started to give him my money to go and buy for me. So you start buying for yourself now. Yes. But how accessible was it back then? Back what? then, crack cocaine was not readily available on the streets. Yes. 
as a matter of fact, mostly you would have to buy the powder and have somebody cook it. There are very few places mm. that you could go and buy crack cocaine already prepared as crack. Did you at any point buy the co the, the powder cocaine and cook no, it up I, for yourself? I have never bought powdered cocaine. To, I I got powdered cocaine. Yes. Free. Yes. And had it cooked for me and all of that. I I have two left handed when it comes to kitchen, right? So <laughs> yeah, cooking was never my <laughs> thing. <laughs> so yeah. So I would always have somebody else do that part of it. But can we talk about how long this continued for? Twenty three years. Twenty three years. Yeah. There was no stopping. Like you yes, did this there every were day. There periods, as a matter of fact, when I lost my first job, nineteen eighty six, mm. to crack cocaine, I went. Into, went to a doctor and they gave me, what did they give me? They gave me sleeping tablets, which I never took because they said if I have problem, I never have problems sleeping once I get off a high. Yes. So I tried doctors, I tried psychiatrists, all the secular programs. After you lost your job? Yeah. You said and that? I was always in and out of jobs over the years, but my first job I lost that to crack cocaine. How and or why? Because... I, for one, was stealing from the company to support the habit. Really? Yeah. My mother had to take out a second mortgage on her house to prevent me from going to prison when I lost To pay back the company? Job. Yeah. So it was that bad? It was that bad. It, it consumes you. That period when you lost your job in 1986, um, what was the time frame between your, the first time that you tried crack cocaine and losing your job? Because that seemed like you were now addicted. Yes. So what was so the time frame? Like two years. Two years. Yeah. Um, so now your family was aware yes. that you were on it and it was after you've lost your job or they've picked no, up signs? it was before because it, it was, I was stealing from home. Yes. I became known. And that is when they realized. And then I would, my aunt and my mother would notice that because where I work, one of my aunt worked there also. Yes. And she would share with my mother that I don't like some of the people that I see coming to, to look for Richard at work, you know? So and you I used to buy at work? No, people come no, sell it like at work? I would smoke in the night, funds are out, but because I would be of, I would say, a certain social standing then. I would get credit easily, but oh. they're expecting to get paid the next day. Yes. So I smoked last night and today I'm at work and they are coming to me at work to collect. For the money? Yeah. So when you could take it from your home, you're not taking it from your job. Right. So you had access to the funds at the workplace. Yes. And I had either to funds or to their, their resources. Really? So I would sell their stuff. Yes. For much less than it was worth. Yes. Just to support the habit. What was the price of crack cocaine at that time? Uh, maybe about, you could get crack cocaine for as low as $20. $20 then. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to take a break. Um, we're hearing the story from, you know, a former drug addict, uh, Mr. Richard Minot. Um, we're going to take a break. I'll come back to hear his story and how he got over his addiction and how he's now helping other people to get over addiction, drug addiction, that is. Once again, this is Boy Things Podcast. We're going to take a quick break. All right, so we're back with uh, Mr. Richard Minot, who is a former drug addict and the executive assistant at the Adult and Teen, Teen Challenge. Challenge Jamaica. So you left us at this um, cliffhanger, basically, that you lost your first job because you were taking resources and money from the job and from your family. You lost this job. You went to the doctor. They tried to help. And uh, this was 1986, no? Yeah. And he said that this time, crack cocaine was like $20, which I'm assuming that that was a lot of money back then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I was $20 could buy you 10 Heineken. Yeah. <laughs> so then you, you, you lost your first job. One would say that you're getting help. You would maybe realize how detrimental crack cocaine is to you and you would stop but you never stopped Mr. Minot no I tried yes but I guess it had me so hooked yes. that I just could not do without it mm. I could go maybe two days at most mm. and then I had to have it 
So then you weren't working at this point. Well, I was... How long you're out of a job for? Maybe about three, four months. So what was funding this three, four months period? No, in that three, four months, I was more smoking cigarette and weed. So you go back but to then that. I was under close scrutiny by family. Yes. Right? And they would make sure they'd buy me my cigarettes. Mm-hmm. So I didn't... And try not to... Try to have me stay at home as much as possible. As much as possible. But so after the three, four months... I got a job working in a bike rental. Mm. And then that you were working in the tourist industry, you're getting tips every day. Mm. So that I could support the habit somewhat. Yes. But then no matter how much money you have, your desire, the more you use is the more you want. Mm. So it, it just kept bleeding me. So you used to take your pay and your tips and everything. Everything went back into that. But then... One who don't understand addiction would say, if you went three, four months without it, you could know after getting this second job, well, do without it. Three, four months is, in terms of addiction, is a short time. Mm. Because addiction is of such that you can suppress it, it can lay dormant. Yes. I had as much as three years of crack cocaine okay. prior to Teen Challenge. What was the most or your worst moment for you whilst doing drug? The worst moment, all right, I did not grow up in a violent setting. Mm. I knew nothing about violence in terms of badmanship or anything like that. But to be held at knife point, to have a gun stuck in your face to say, you alone can't smoke, you know, I have to get some of it too. Can you walk us through that story about the gun point? Uh, I used to go to, I never enjoyed smoking on a crack base. Mm -hmm. But depending on where I live at the time and who was around, I might not be able to smoke at home. Mm-hmm. When I was living at my mother's house, I had my own room. I'd lock up in my room and smoke. Mm-hmm. And I would always have cigarette lit in there. So she come in and she smell cigarette. It's a mask. And she might know yeah. that, uh, yes, I'm doing more than that, but she's not seeing it. Yes. So I was on, I remember left work one evening, going to the drug base. And I had, them days we had the red $50. Mm. I had a couple of them in my shirt pocket. Just buy a pack of cigarettes. And this guy walk up to me and beg me some money. And I say, no, I mean, I have none. Yeah. He could see that I have money in my pocket. And he slashed at me with a knife. And I got the tip of the knife caught on the side of my face. Got like a quarter inch cut, but that kind of... And funny enough, not having that sort of a experience and background, you'd think that I would go home instead of continue to go to the, on the base. Mm. I just couldn't help myself. Yeah. I went there. And he came there and was still pestering me and what have you. But on the base with other people that are used to you being there and know that, yes, they will get something out of you once they're there. They, they tend to protect you mm. somewhat. But yes. the minute the other person is either better than them or able to do more than you are doing, mm. you now become a nobody again. Yes. So that wasn't the first incident, the knife incident. On the same base one night, the same guy walked up to me. I went outside the building to urinate, and he just walked up to me and pulled a gun and was demanding money. Mm. Then the owner of the base saw what was happening and came out and said, no, you can't do that in my place. And he left. Yeah. But for me, that was really scary. But, but then only, you continued. That, that stopped me from going to that base. Are you for, the next base? As, I left Montego Bay, came to Kingston, not knowing Kingston. Mm-hmm. My sister was living with my uncle here in Kingston. Yes. And within two days of coming to Kingston, I found a crack base. How you find it so fast? Who did you contact? There is something about addicts that you might say we have a sixth sense for it. Mm. And you will pick out an addict quickly, also yes. a fellow addict. Yes. And that's what I did. 
You just find it. I was walking from my uncle's house to a girlfriend's house. Yes. Right through Barbican Square. Yes. And I saw somebody and I said, this man must know where it is. Yeah. I asked him and he could direct me to where it was. How bad did it get for you financially? And what were you doing now to support this addiction? Okay. I got to the point where I was doing just about anything. Thank God, apart from embezzling money from my workplace, I never w got into the breaking into people's houses and mm -hmm. cars and begging on the street sort of thing. Yes. But I would pray on my family, my brother in particular. Yes. He's the youngest of five of us. So as big brother, I should be looking out for him, which growing up I did, mm -hmm. you know, and he would look up to me. But when I became a crack addict, even though he was always helping me, every time I lost a job, he would help me to get another job. He gave me maybe what, two, at least two vehicles mm. so I could earn a living. Yes. And all of that money just went back into crack cocaine. Now, it took him and his wife putting down their feet and having me arrested for breaking into their house for me to go to Teen Challenge. Yes. And that is where my life turned around. You said that you were getting jobs. So I'm trying to wonder if other persons could identify outside of your family members? Well, was it known you uh, had relationships? Okay, say so you have a girlfriend. Yes. So other people like picked up that you were you, oh, yes. uh, abusing oh, yes. drugs? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, when I went to the first rehab and the people I saw that came to visit me, it was a detox facility at Cornwall Regional. I felt like I didn't know all these people knew. Mm -hmm. And when I came out and was doing well and the, all the, the, the praise and, you know, the, the well wishes and stuff that you're getting, you said, but I was fooling myself. It's like everybody else knew that I had a problem except me. Yeah. I was the last to know that I had a problem. Yes. I was not acknowledging that I was destroying myself. Yeah. So <laughs> you are a functioning addict then? Basically. Yes, yes, for the most part. For the most part. Okay, so fast forward us now. Your brother and his sister, they called the police on you. Yes. So did you... All right, I went to Teen Challenge. Yes. The first time I went into Teen Challenge, I left the same day because I was not in agreement with some of their rules and guidelines. Mm -hmm. That's a strict program. Yes. And two years later, I went back on my own. Yes. Spent two weeks and left. When I went home thinking I had a home to go to, my mother had changed the locks on the grill. So I was now sleeping in the garage or in the bushes. When my brother and his wife gone to work, I'd break into his house, steal whatever I could to maintain the habit. Mm. And I guess at one point they just said, no, this is enough. How many times did you go to rehab? I went to first detox in Montego Bay. I went to Patricia House. Went to Dr. Abel's place up in Red Hills. I would say four. And none, the teen challenge. and none of those times. All right. None of that the worked. When I went to rehab the first time, which was the detox facility at Cornwall Regional, I was doing the AANA program, 12-step program. And during that time, I had three years clean time. Yes. But what I found happened to me in that three years is that I had switched my addiction from cocaine to women. Oh. So I had multiple partners. Yes. Even though I had my... my Bonified. I had my, my son's yes. mother who I was living with at the time and well my daughter's mother and i were we had broken up from early because of crack cocaine okay your children did they know that their father was a drug addict at that time i my daughter's 
might have known, my son would have known, because I would say, yes, they knew, but they probably never, were probably too young to really to understand. understand what really was happening. My daughters never really knew me yes. because of my addiction. I yeah. was never there for them. How many years have you been off drug now? Uh, 17. 17 years. And it's because of Teen Challenge Jamaica? Because of Christ through Teen Challenge Jamaica. Because of Christ. Through Teen Challenge So you turned your life over to God? Yes. Yes. Um, can you just walk us now through, you said that you went to Teen Challenge Jamaica now on your own. Um, this time you're serious about recovering, I'm so assuming. I so you, oh, so you weren't? No. Did two weeks and left. Mm. And I was out there for two weeks before I was arrested. And during that two weeks, I was living in my mother's garage or in the bushes. Yes. If I didn't steal anything today mm -hmm. from them, I would feel comfortable to sleep in the garage. If I stole from them, I would stay in the bushes. Were you working at this time? No. And you weren't realizing that you were an addict, addict, and it no, may have I realized by okay. now because it was my life was now miserable. Yes. My life was now hell, living hell. But I just could not help myself. So then you went back to Teen Challenge? No. It, but when I went the second time and stayed for two weeks, the third time yes. I was court ordered. Oh, so because when you were arrested now? My brother had me arrested, as a matter of fact. He orchestrated it, and it was after Teen Challenge that I realized how well orchestrated my arrest was. Mm. It's not like he just called the cops. He had a friend come in and do it. Mm. You would think after sharing this for 16 years, I would be strong enough to share it without tears. We're going to take a break on that note. We're here with Mr. Richard Minot. That's you know, okay. I, no, I no, I don't have any qualms about it. We're going to go to a break real quick. No, I don't. No? I don't have any qualms about sh shedding a tear. It doesn't. The tears that you're, and the emotions that you're feeling right now, can you just explain them to me? When I think about my brother, like I said, baby brother. Mm. I should be the one protecting him. Right. He's always bailing me out. To the point where he had to have me arrested. Just to get you. Yeah. We're here with Mr. Uh, Richard Minot. So we're going to go to a break. When we'll come back, he'll you know, continue his story about his journey, about recovering from you know, drug abuse and how he's here right now in this place. All right, Mr. Minot. So we, you're talking about you now, you went to Teen Challenge Jamaica for two weeks. You thought you know, that you were ready, but then you weren't. Yes. So, so talk to us about that after that two weeks period yes i went to teen challenge and did two weeks so i got a taste of what teen challenge had to offer but i still wasn't ready for it so i left i'm ready to go i went back home only to find that i didn't have a home to go back to my mother had changed the locks on the grill and i was the only one still at home with my parents my father had passed already, so it was just me and my mother alone at home. So I went home and went back to the same old, same old. And I would still continue to pray on my brother and his family mm -hmm. to the point where if I couldn't find liquor or money or cologne, something of value to sell, I would resort to cleaning out his children's piggy bank. Your nephews and nieces. Yes. And these were prep school children at the time. So I'll be praying on my niece and nephews now, not just my brother and his wife. And my brother, I think, knew by then that he wasn't doing me any good by keep bailing me out. And it took his wife to really 
put down her foot for them to have me arrested. You know, and my brother had his friend do it for him. Mm. And I guess that was his way of preventing me from going through a rough arrest because I wasn't even handcuffed when I was arrested. I was just put in the back of the police car and taken to jail as if I was just going there probably to, to give a statement or something. Yes. Now, when I went to jail and I, in my mind I'm saying, well, my brother is always the one bailing me out. When mm -hmm. everybody else would stand back and say, no, enough is enough. He would always be there for me. Mm -hmm. So when I got to jail, in my mind, I'm saying, well, this is prison. Whatever happens when I go to court, yes. I am not going to draw the process out. I'm just going to plead guilty and face the music, so to speak. Spent three days in jail. When I, in that three days, I smoked more weed in jail than I did on the streets on a normal basis. Mm. When I went to court and resigned myself to pleading guilty and facing the music, my entire family was there. And they came with a letter from Teen Challenge to say that they would take me back. Yes. I was given an 18 month suspended sentence. And I chose Teen Challenge not because I wanted to go to Teen Challenge. I chose Teen Challenge because I didn't want to go to prison. Yes. And I've been to jail twice before, and I've been to Teen Challenge twice, twice before. before. So I knew the difference. You had to make a choice. Right. So I made, yes. I select, chose the better of two evils yes. in my mind. When you look back at um, you know, stealing from your niece and your nephew, um, what goes through your mind you now looking back at young Richard? Looking back? And the turmoil how, that you put your brother and his how, wife through. How could I be so cruel? Yeah. How could I be so cruel? That's a, the, the, the thought that goes through my mind. Yeah. But funny enough, none of them hold it against me. Yeah. And for me, that is the greatest thing. Yeah. Because I could have lost my entire family. And being a teen challenge, you see so many people that will have nothing to do with their family, even after they have completed the program and are doing well, they still maintain that bitterness. So because we do by hurt you. people. And they stood by you. Yes. Throughout all of that. Yes. Support is important. Um, so going now to Teen Challenge, you made a choice. Okay, never want to go back to jail. You made a choice. Well, basically you're forced, but this is no your yes. reality. Yes. Um, how long were you there for under their okay, program? The Teen Challenge program is a 12 to 18 months residential. Mm -hmm. And it's a Christ-centered program. So at Teen Challenge, Adult and Teen Challenge, as we are now called, we teach biblical principles because we believe, and I say we because I am now a major part of Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge is my life now. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. We teach biblical principles as the way of one changing people's life. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, when I went to Teen Challenge and start, I decided if I kick against the prick, so to speak, my program is going to be that much harder. Yes. So let me submit. So I was doing everything that I should do. I was so you're very open now at this point. Yes. Yes. And. Maybe it is because I was determined not to go to prison. Yes. So I could not afford to be kicked out at Teen Challenge. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to leave, mm -hmm. but I wasn't going to get kicked out either. How hard was it though for you within this 12 to 18 month block um, to n not want to leave or to do drug? You know, I, not to scratch that, you know, itch. I, it wasn't very hard. It might have been challenging in that you're in a program with all male, mm -hmm. and male of woman. Yes. Right? So you're an all male program. <laughs> yes. And somebody tell you what to do, when to do, how to do. So that is a challenging part of mm -hmm. it. 
But I found for me that submitting rather than finding everything else wrong, mm -hmm. just go through the motions, do what yeah. you have to do. So that is what I started to do. Yes. Now, there is a strict schedule at Teen Challenge. Like I said, you're told what to do when, when do. and what. So you're yeah. on a timetable mm -hmm. from your get up. In my day, it was you get up at six mm -hmm. and you're scheduled up until 10. Yes. You have breaks in between. Like between each activity, you might have a 15 minute, 10 or 15 minute break. Mm -hmm. Separate from your lunch break and your supper break. Yes. Breakfast, lunch, and supper, yeah. So after you've completed this journey, yeah, I'm sure that you've, you've must have been proud of yourself. You've completed this 18 months. Um, you gave your life to God within this process. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, tell me the reaction from your family members and what happened after in terms of jobs and you being a newfound person um, and turning your life around. Uh, how did that feel? Okay. It was, all right, when I completed Usually they have a graduation once a year. Mm -hmm. And the batch that I graduated in, it's almost like it was just my graduation. Mm. Entire family was there. People who I figure wouldn't have nothing to do with me again were there in support. It was a, a wonderful feeling, a yes. great feeling. When I can go home and see handbags on the dining table, bedroom doors left open, yes. people willing to give you the car key if you go wherever you want to go. Those little things yes. meant much. Yeah. Because there's a point in my life as an addict, any family function I am at, there's always a bedroom that is locked. Wow. And that's where every all the ladies' handbags are, all the valuables are put away there because Richard mm. is in the house. Yes. So now everybody is so proud of you. Yeah. You got a job after? Yes, I stayed on a teen challenge, mm -hmm. did a year as an intern, Yes. year and a half as a staff member, and a cousin of mine that I used to work for on and off, he was doing ground transportation for the airlines in Montego Bay. Mm -hmm. And he bought a vehicle specifically for me to drive. And I went back to doing that. But I just wasn't happy. It wasn't fulfilling. Yeah. It was going against all of my newfound new beliefs and, and things. Yes. yes. Because at the airport, any of the airports, I assume, I've never worked Kingston Airport, but any one of those industries that is so highly competitive is a dog eat dog world. And there are times when you're asked to do things or find yourself needing to do things to survive. Yes. That really goes against Christian principles. Yes. So I wasn't comfortable and I started job hunting. And the director, Anthony Richards, director of Teen Challenge, called me and... No, I called him up for a recommendation when I was job hunting. He gave me the recommendation and then he said, to me, maybe two, three weeks later, that if I don't get anything, I must yeah, let can't him come back. No, he didn't say can come oh, back. Oh, just let him then, know. Yeah. Okay. Then he called me a holy Thursday. Mm -hmm. I had worked all night, just come in, when he called me and said, I need you to come and take your old job back. Yes. Because the guy that had taken over from me, he started acting up and nobody could talk to him and mm. whatever. So I went back and I've been back there since. So I... Since 2007, I've had a one-year break from Teen Challenge. Yes, and you've just been there helping people. Yeah. Um, for the persons who are watching right now who may be addicted to anything at all, because we don't even realize that as a nation, you know, that is so culturally infused with alcohol, that alcohol is an addiction as well. We can be addicted to our phones. We can be addicted to sex. We can be addicted to, you know, something as, well, me, my vape, um, so anybody who is watching right now who is in a position of maybe not recognizing or accepting that there's an addict, that there is or they are an addict, or for anyone right now in, an, in the recovering phase, um, what would you say to them and how they can reach out to you and the um, Adult and Teen Challenge Jamaica um, program? Okay. Adult and Teen Challenge 
Jamaica. We are in St. Anne, mm -hmm. right? We are in the Yellow Pages. Mm -hmm. We are online. So we are, e we are easily accessible. Yes. But we don't really do advertisement per se. So you wouldn't see an ad on TV or yeah. on the radio about us. But yeah. Addiction Alert is, is aware of us. National Council on Drug Abuse is aware of us. Yes. As a matter of fact, we do partner with them. We are there for almost all of their seminars that they do. Mm -hmm. And most churches yes. on the island know of us. Okay. Some of them do partner with us. You know, as sponsors, we have a choir that go out to different church almost every Sunday where possible. And we minister in song and testimony. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised the, the reaction you get, the support you get from people just hearing and seeing what the Lord is doing in the lives of these men yes. that were once considered the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the nobodies, the, the unchangeable, unhelpable. Yes. You know, but that's what we do at Teen Challenge. Changes. And, you guys are you changing know, lives. I, I know that my God is a God that delights in making the impossible possible. Mm. Love that. So um, if you need to contact Teen Challenge, um, Teen and Adult Challenge yes. Jamaica, the contact number is actually 876-795-2695. Once again, 876-795-2695. I must just say, Mr. Minot, your story is so inspiring. Um, and I must say, I appreciate you for coming here to share your story. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, with this episode, it will help a lot of people who may be going through this thing called life and trying to figure out, you know, am I an addict? Like, how do I get help? You know, but if you can change, then anybody can change through Christ and through the work that, you know, Tina Don't Challenge Jamaica that you guys are doing down there. So, you know, kudos to you. Thank you once again for being here. I appreciate you very much. Thank you for sharing. Your story is, I have goosebumps right now, just by you telling it. All right. So that's it, guys. Um, that was the episode. All right. So, you know, this episode was recorded and edited and produced by Studio 45, located at the Trade Center, 30 to 32 Reynolds Road, unit number 45. And also it was produced by my lovely producer, Sonia Stewart. Also big up to my sponsor, you know, Big Bad Shirt by Bridge Official. Remember, you know, if you use Boya Ting's code or name or any way, shape or form, you can get 30% off any item in their store. Anything at all you want, just use Boya Ting's. And also for Peckish, you can just use Boya Ting's. And for any catering needs, you will get a free appetizer just using the code name Boya Ting's. Now, this episode, trust me, was so inspiring and so compelling. So I'll leave you with this quote for this week. If you accept the expectations of others, especially negative ones, then you will never change the outcome this was by michael jordan until next week wednesday well next week sunday or until next week my name is karen boy this was boy podcast i'll see you next week thank you for watching